first session um, is going to be about writing, um, how to write as a journalist, how to write as an activist, how to get your point of view across through the medium of the pen and the paper or the type pad and the screen. Um, before, uh, before I introduce John, I'd like to start with two short quotes from writers that I greatly admire. Um, the first is a quote from um, Arundhati Roy, uh, the Indian writer and activist, and she says, um, our, strategy, our strategy should be not only to confront empire, but to lay siege to it, to deprive it of oxygen, to shame it, to mock it with our art, our music, our literature, our stubbornness, our joy, our brilliantness, our sheer, our sheer relentlessness, and our ability to tell our own stories. Stories that are different from the ones we're being brainwashed to believe. The corporate revolution will collapse if we <coughs> refuse to buy what they're selling. Their ideas, their versions of history, their wars, their weapons, and their notions of inevitability. And the second quote I'd like to just uh, read to you is by another writer, uh, Ken Sarawiwa, the Nigerian oil activist who was executed. And he says... Um, a writer cannot be a mere storyteller, he cannot be a mere teacher, he cannot merely x-ray society's weaknesses, its ills, its perils. He, or she, must be actively involved in shaping its present and its future. And I think that's what we're all here to do today. Um, so to talk us through writing um, <coughs> as an activist um, and as a brilliant writer, we have John Rees, who has been a journalist for many years, I asked him how many books he's written, and the answer was oh, about seven. Um, he's written from um, the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, smuggling copy back and forth um, under the noses of the secret police. He's written from Tahrir Square, and he's written loads of books. So it's a privilege to uh, to, to get some lessons from him today. So <laughs> thank you. John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, and obviously we have to thank our sponsors for today's <laughs> event. Um, <laughs> we'll come to that in a minute. Um, uh, the, uh, the first thing, I guess, is that this is a bit of a con, because it's not about writing, it's about changing the world, and the relationship uh, that writing has to doing, uh, to doing that. Because, um, as I think it was clear from what Chris was saying at the beginning, um, writing and the technique of writing uh, is always subordinate uh, to purpose. Um, it depends on what you're writing, why you're writing it, and who you're writing it for. That will determine the kind of writing that you want to engage, to engage in. And um, I just want to mention three sorts of writing to, get, to illustrate that point. Advertising, which is actually why this is up here, um, has an obvious relationship with its intended audience. It wants to sell your product and it wants to get you to buy the product very, very quickly indeed. And for that reason, it's worth looking at its techniques because like I'm loving it, you know exactly what this is in three words and it <coughs> indicates what the nature of the product is even if you don't recognize the golden arches and it's transmitting in unmistakable, obvious and clear language to an <coughs> absolutely universal audience what this is about. And advertising, you know, whether or not you approve of its, its purpose or whether or not you like its product, um, has a, a way with words which is direct and is meant to speak to an absolutely mass audience. And that's always worth something, that's always worth uh, understanding the technique that's being, that's being, used, uh, that's being used there. Um, I suppose at the completely the opposite end of the, of the spectrum is um, academic writing. <laughs> now academic <laughs> writing, in my view, is barely writing at all. Um, and, 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 for this, and for this reason, academics um, write for a closed audience. It's exactly the opposite of advertising. Advertising is meant to be absolutely universal because absolutely anybody is intended to be the customer of this, of this product. Academic writing is um, meant to be, is designed to be for a closed audience of other academics. <coughs> if you, anybody is going through the academic system now will know that you are told that you have to get published in academic journals, i.e. peer-reviewed journals. So you don't get published, you literally do not get published unless other academics approve, agree about the nature 
of the of the writing. It's a closed uh, it's a closed environment. If you look at academic book publishing, it's not meant for a mass market. It's often specialised publishers. You can pay 70, 80 pounds for academic monographs, um, and well, evidently that's not a mass market thing, is it? It's not on the airport uh, stall as you go as you go by, and it affects the way in which things are written, just as when uh, medieval monks um, wrote for a closed audience in the Middle Ages, it affected, you know, it was literally closed in the sense that they were the literate ones and the mass of the population were not. Um, it affects the way, the manner, the use of words. This is, uh, this is from a paragraph from uh, a book uh, by John Romer called Analytical Marxism, which um, there's a misuse of language right there in the title because it's neither analytical nor, in my view, is it actually Marxism, but we'll <laughs> move on uh, move on for that. This is actually one of the uh, simpler uh, paragraphs in the book, and it says, I have arrived at such a theory only by experimenting with many models that were designed to study Marxian exploitation. My approach to these models was to change the institutional environment in which Marxian exploitation resides, and then to ask if Marxian exploitation <laughs> continues to exist. How robust is the Marxian phenomena with respect to changes in its institutional habitat? The models that are discussed are the variants of Marx's exploitation are presented in sections one to four. Through these institutional experiments with Marxian exploitation, I have been able to develop an endogenous theory of class formation and to demonstrate the relationship between exploitation and class. So, okay, um, who understands <laughs> what was being said there? That's good, because I was going to ask anybody who did to leave, because uh, obviously <laughs> just, you were in the wrong place. Um, that, that, uh, that, uh, th this permeates academic writing, and it is not designed to transmit clearly the idea, of, I mean actually that paragraph could be re actually reduced to a couple of sentences very, very easily indeed, but it's not meant to do that, and that's one of the easier paragraphs in the book. Um, there's another form of writing with which we're all familiar, which is bureaucratic forms. You know, the form films that you, you form that you fill in if you want a passport, or a driving license, or to send in your tax return. And as everybody knows, these are a nightmare. Yeah. And they're a nightmare because of the power relation behind them. They do not need you to understand this, but you do need to fill in this form and have it accepted by them. You're in a position of weakness, they are in a position of power, they are under no obligation whatsoever to make this form clear and understandable or written in a way which will uh, assist you. And although there are constant campaigns like the Campaign for Clear English and whatnot, which constantly badger these institutions to, to improve the communication skills, they don't. And it's because of the power relation and the purpose, uh, and the purpose behind it. So we're in a different situation. We're in a situation where um, we want to communicate sometimes complex ideas, always uh, unconventional ideas to a mass uh, to a mass audience, and that determines the shape of the kind of writing um, that we want uh, that we want to use. And the most um, approximate form of this writing for us, I think, is good tabloid journalism. Good tabloid journalism is designed to transmit ideas to a mass working class audience. I mean, they can be right-wing ideas, like those in The Sun, or they can be uh, progressive ideas, like those in The Daily Mirror at the height of its uh, sort of relationship with the labour movement in the 60s and 70s, when people like John Pilger and Paul Foote regularly wrote for it. But the form that it uses is designed to transmit absolutely clearly to people who have very little time to read, or often reading on the tube, or the top of the bus, or on the train, or at their break in work, uh, a series of political ideas. And they have a particular form uh, for doing that, a particular short form, simple form of writing, which if you're beginning to write, or even if you've been writing for some time, it's my belief you have to master in order to be able to write clearly. You have to be, write, write, be able to write simply before you can write complexly. You have to be able to know how to express yourself in the simplest, plainest form before you can begin to, uh, to, to write differently. Now, a lot of journalism has changed since then. Because of the sort of the effect of modern technology, because of the change in the political environment, for all sorts of reasons, that kind of campaigning tabloid journalism is <coughs> at a premium at the moment. And what replaces it a lot of the time is op-ed columns, is opinion-led columns. And so you get columnist after columnist who basically 
they're kind of advertising themselves and their style of writing. They're not designed to communicate factual information and analysis swiftly and effectively to a mass audience. And that's an art which I think that we need to recover. There's criticisms, of course, of tabloid journalism. If you want to watch the Levinson Inquiry, you can see everything that's wrong with uh, tabloid journalism. But some of the techniques, um, if they're properly appropriated by radicals, are the beginning. They're the platform from which all really good, good, good writing begins. One more health warning, and that's that writing in itself, it shouldn't be an aim. Leon Trotsky said about revolutionaries, he said, you have to be able to write without becoming a writer, to speak without becoming a, a narrator, to organise without being merely uh, an organiser, to be a trade unionist without becoming a syndicalist. In other words, any form of specialism or compartmentalization will weaken you because <coughs> the specialisation cuts you off from the source of, uh, of, of, uh, of writing. So um, let's just talk about what that is. You see, to write, you have to have something to say, pretty obvious, um, but where do you get the something from? And uh, the only way you can begin when you sit down in front of the screen or sit down with the pen and have sufficient motivation to actually begin to write or want to write, you have to have something to say and you only get something to say from experience. It's the only way, it's the only thing that any of us have. But there are different levels of experience. There's your personal experience that you saw it, smelt it, heard it whatever, you know, that in some way your five senses received this information pers at a personal experience. There's indirect experience, which is that you've heard one way or another of somebody else's experience, that either historically you read that there was a demonstration in 1640 in the middle of, uh, of, of London, or you heard what happened on the other side of the square uh, in a demonstration where you were on this uh, side of, of the square. Indirect experience transmitted to you in written, spoken, film form from other people. And then there's condensed experience, which is that we can see a pattern in what other people have seen or heard or said. That we can compare the Egyptian revolution to the Russian revolution or to the Spanish revolution. That there's differences and similarities between, uh, between these things. That what happens to me at work today has been happening to my friends and my family and people like me, not just this year, not just this last decade, but for centuries. In other words, there's a pattern that emerges from experience and theory, all theory, is really condensed experience. It's an expression of what happens, uh, but in an abstracted way. That we're, it's not just that I had a bad day at work, but we're all having a bad day at work and for these, uh, and for these, and for these reasons. Now really, when you write, You've got to try and combine all these things. You know, when I write from Tahir Square, you know, all right, as I did during the course of the, the last week, all right, I was on, I was at the, the Talat Harb end of, of Tahir Square. Was the same thing happening down the Egyptian Museum end of Tahir Square? Without knowing that, you know, I mean, my personal experience is standing around there are, are of interest, but was this the character of the whole demonstration or just what was happening in the corner that I was in? How do you compare it with the demonstrations that happened at the beginning of the Egyptian revolution or about demonstrations in other revolutions? Now, those three things, my experience at one end of the square, somebody else's experience at the other end of the square, and a comparison between this demonstration and demonstrations in other revolutions, that's those three elements. And if you're to make any sense of the experience or for it to transmit itself in a generally useful way, any article, even short articles, have to have those, uh, those elements in it. Um, but then when you've got the experience and you've analysed it and you've decided what you want to say, why you want to say it, that you're inspired or motivated or appalled or in some way the experience has driven you to want to put it on, uh, to put it on paper, this is the most important thing that anybody can tell you. It's an old adage from the National Union of Journalists and it says, get it written, don't get it right. And what it means is um, you can spend, an inc and people do, spend an incredibly long time trying to think it all through, get it all right in their mind, work it all out until they're ready to write. You'll never be ready to write. There's a long, long way between that. Actually, the best thing to do is just start bashing it out. <coughs> it doesn't matter whether it's ill-formed, badly worded, that you uh, messed up the logic of it. 
Of course you should have a plan before you sit down. You think, I'm going to do this and this and this and I have three or four points. That's what I always do when I'm sitting down to write. But then you've got to hit the keyboard and you've got to get it done. This is why journalists are very, very good. They have deadlines to meet. And having a deadline to meet <laughs> is an absolutely brilliant thing because it forces you to do this. It forces you to get it written. Now, after you've got it written, of course, you can cross it out, rewrite it, reformulate it. Usually, one very good thing is when you write like this, usually the first paragraph's rubbish. So just cross it out and start with the second paragraph. Because nearly <laughs> everybody warms up with the first paragraph and they need to get going. And when you've got going, just cross it out and start with the second, uh, and start with the, the second uh, paragraph. Um, the other thing about it is think that you're going to write like tabloid journalists write. You're going to write short. This is Blaise Pascal, who was a French mathematician, philosopher, inventor in the 17th century. And this is uh, an absolutely brilliant idea. I'm sorry I have wearied you, wearied you with such a long letter, but I did not have the time to write you a short one. Um, now, it takes more effort to write short than to write long. Any idiot could keep on pouring it out onto the page. But concision, preciseness, formulating things clearly and shortly, that's an art. And that's what tabloid journalism does. If you look at the Daily Mirror or the Sun, there are no sentences or very few sentences that have subordinate clauses. There are very few long sentences. And there are very few paragraphs that have more than two sentences in them. And the more you can write shortly, briefly and concisely, the clearer the writer you will, uh, you will be. It takes more effort, this is Pascal's point, it takes more effort and thought to write short than it takes to write long. That's why advertising and tabloid journalism are superior to academic writing, because any idiot can go on at this length, and many idiots in academia do. Um, now, the person who can really, if you're only ever going to read one thing about writing, the one thing that you should write, I I you read, is George Orwell's Politics and the English Language. Orwell was himself, of course, a brilliant writer. Um, you know, everybody knows, perhaps many people have read at school, the, the novels 1984 and Animal Farm and so forth. My personal view is that his book, uh, Homage to Catalonia, which is his experience of the... Uh, Spanish Revolution is one of the, if not the best single books about revolution written by anybody anywhere. Its opening page, just its opening page, is the single best description of uh, a working class in power in Barcelona in 1936 that you'll uh, read anywhere. But he was brilliant about to write, not just about, he was not just a brilliant writer, but he was brilliant about writing. In the politics of the English language, he has these points. And if you can stick to these, uh, and you only stick to these, you'll probably be a perfectly decent writer. And he analyzes that. And he says, uh, never use a metaphor, or simile, or other figure of speech um, which you're used to seeing in print. Because the whole point about a metaphor is that it dramatizes what you're writing. So if you're going to say, well, we've each reached the end of the road, that was what Orwell called a dead simile. Because it's in such common use that it's no longer a simile. We all know what that means. It means we've reached the end of things, and the whole road bit of imagining a road and the end of the road, that's lost, because that's no longer a fresh, uh, a fresh uh, imaginative expression of that idea. Um, and never use a long word where a short one will, to do, will do. That's absolutely uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant advice. And even better advice is, if it's possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. Um, it's, it's actually, when you're reading, if you've got a lot of adjectives in the sentence, it's tiring. You know, in a single sentence, it's fine. But sentence after sentence, paragraph after paragraph, it's wearing. It's tiring. It's obscuring the meaning of what you're trying to say, not uh, illuminating it. Um, uh, never use the passive where you can use the active. That's, it's a, that's a political point in many, in, in many ways. Um, if you say um, uh, that a million jobs were lost in the economy, that's a passive, you know, that sounds like it's the weather. That sounds like something's just kind of occurred. But if you say a million people were thrown out of work by the capitalists this week, <laughs> we all understand what that, or even if you omit the word capitalist, thrown out of work, you know that somebody is doing something to somebody, and whether and you can make it, and people are encouraged to make a judgment just by formulating it 
in that way. If you say a million people lost their jobs, it's like they were careless. You know, they were just wandering on, they lost it. Um, it's a natural occurrence which is just going on in, the, uh, on in the system. If you write passively, if you write actively, it's about somebody doing something. Some class, some person, some individual doing something to some other individual or class. Um, it's quite right what it says, never use a foreign uh, phrase, a scientific word or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English uh, equivalent. There's no point in saying as um, no doubt media studies students are uh, encouraged to do, uh, mais en scène, when you mean just setting the scene. There's no point in saying ide fix when you simply mean that this is a fixed idea. There's no point in saying stricto senso uh, when you mean strictly speaking. That's uh, to obscure what you're trying to say for most, uh, for most ordinary, uh, more ordinary readers. And the final thing, break any of these rules sooner than saying anything outright barbarous. Um, so, you know, you can get a long way with just those rules. You can also get a long way with the fundamentals of any, which you get taught in any journalism thing, that when you're sitting down to write, ask yourself these questions. Who, what, where, when, why? They're the absolute you know, fundamentals of any uh, form of uh, writing. And we're just going to um, have a look at uh, a copy of the Metro. Yeah. Um, yeah because um, <coughs> Sam's got these, uh, it, it's just accident that this happens to be it, but the, the lead story on the Metro has got a, have you got the one I read on there? Well, um, this story on the front is absolutely brilliant because it's, um, it's almost completely made up really. <laughs> um, I mean, not that it's untrue, it's quite a good story actually, but um, but the actual amount of text there um, is massively greater than the necessity for it. And uh, it's very interesting to see why. So if you look at those questions, who, what, where, when, why, every single one of them is answered, and the journalist is doing their job here, is answered in the first paragraph. In fact, the whole story is the first paragraph. Uh, three out of four uh, rail passengers, that's who, um, on some routes, that's where, are unhappy <laughs> about the cost of tickets, that's what and why, uh, and the standard of service they get. Now that is a brilliant compression, that first sentence is a brilliant compression of everything that's contained in the headline of the article, and everything else in that, re e nearly everything else in this article, is subsidiary information illustrating one of those points that you already know in the, first, in the very first sentence of uh, the article. So if you look through the rest of the article, it's essentially elaboration. It's a bit more information, some statistics, some quotes. And also it's organized in a classic journalistic style in which it doesn't follow the logic of the story, it follows the logic of how it's set up for print. So look at the end of the story and um, you'll find that the sort of additional information or additional colour or additional facts are all stacked up at the back of the story. And, they, and usually they'll end with a quote. Now you might think, well they've got a quote from somebody, why don't we put that near the top of the story? Or why don't we put, because it's not essential, it's illustration. So they put it, at, you, if you, you read newspaper article after newspaper article, and they'll end with the quote or with some additional statistic. This ends, if you go backwards, the last paragraph, the one before it, the one before that are all quotes. Then there's a statistic, and then there's a little bit more information after that. So those last one, two, three, four, five, six um, uh, paragraphs are essentially additional information which tell you very little more than you learn in the first paragraph. And the reason it's organized like that is because um, when newspapers were um, literally typeset with hot type, with lead, with lead type, the space would be there when the compositor, when the typesetter was looking at the page. And if the copy that was sent down was longer than the space, the typesetter would simply rip out the lead type and chuck it back in the bin as they went up. So they cut from the bottom. And copy subs are told to do this now still. You cut from the bottom of the thing. So the way the journalist writes is that the less essential information, the illustration is piled up, no matter what the logic of the story, at the bottom of it. Because it's simply ripped out originally by typesetters. I mean, a lot of what we do is because of the nature of printed 
paper. The reason why letters are called uppercase and lowercase, capitals and uh, lowercase, is because a, a compositor, a typesetter, would have two cases in front of them. A wooden case with all the lowercase letters here and all the capital letters here, because when you're setting type, you <coughs> want the letters that you use most frequently, i.e. The, the, the lowercase ones, closest to you, so you're setting type like this. So those are all in the lowercase, and all the capitals, which you have to reach up for, are in literally the wooden uppercase, and that's why it's upper and lower uh, and lower case letters. So there's a lot of journalism which is de derived from that, but very sensibly derived uh, from those things. So I mean, perhaps we'll stop now for a little bit. There's a bit, there's a bit more to talk about, quite a lot more to talk about. But maybe if people have got well questions and things about some what we've done so yeah. far. Yeah. So well, what we thought we'd what we thought we'd do now is have like a quick sort of. Uh, interactive bit where you've all got a metro in front of you and so in your in your pairs if you'd like to go through the paper and find more examples of where this has been done so find identify in the first paragraph the who what where why and when identify the fluff at the end of the paragraph so we'll just give people five minutes to do that there's a lot a lot to take in see if it yeah basically test it see if it really works Oh, obviously, I mean, a lot of it, I mean, <laughs> you can't read, as we've just discovered, you can't read the tabloid press, and let's face it, the Metro um, isn't the worst of them, um, without reacting to the political <laughs> content of it. But a lot of what, of what I guess I'm trying to stress is that there's a, a particular, you know, nobody had any difficulty understanding <coughs> what was meant in these stories. It isn't like when I read out the bit from Analytical Marx and they'd be saying, oh, fuck is that about? You know, everybody's absolutely clear. They might not look, we might not like what's being said, but we're clear about what's being said <coughs> and what the information is. And that's because this is written, as I said, it's exactly like as I described it at the beginning. They're very short sentences. There are very few sentences that have got subordinate clauses. Um, and there are very few paragraphs that have got more than, actually in this case, more than one and certainly more than two uh, sentences. And as I say, it's not the only way of writing. But if you can't master the simplest and the most direct forms of communication, you will get lost when trying to write in more complex in, in more complex ways. I mean, like I say, the op-ed people who write, you know, who, who it's their personality that's supposed to be at least half the selling point, as opposed to the content or the ideas in the in, in the column. You can get, you know, it's, it's a very fashionable way of writing. I mean, Laurie Penny, whose politics, you know, are sympathetic to the left. But when you read a Laurie Penny column, it is kind of all about me. It's, you know, it's look at me writing. And, you know, there are times when you can do look at me writing, but you've got to be aware that you're obscuring the point that's, or the meaning of what's being, of what's being expressed, unless the meaning is look at me. Um, <laughs> may well be the case in some cases. But, of course, you know, once you've got that, um, it's, possible, it's possible to do other things. This is um, Mark Twain. Um, and this is, a, this is absolutely brilliant because it's a complete marriage of form and content. This is him explaining um, that a writer may, at some, on some occasions, use long sentences. And he says, at times, he may indulge himself with a long one, but he will make sure that there are no folds in it, no vagueness, no parenthetical interruptions of its view as a whole. When he is done with it, it won't be a sea serpent with half its arches under the water. It will be a torchlight procession. Now, that is not only a brilliant uh, description of why you can use a long sentence, it is a brilliant long sentence. Um, and as he says, every single part of it is as clear, as transparent, as when the tabloid press are using very short sentences and very, uh, and very uh, short paragraphs. But in my view, this is like a tabloid sentence, or several of them, connected up. It's so clear. Each section, each subclause is so clear and so clearly ordered that it's as transparent as if you were writing short sentences. So that's one thing. I'm just going to sort of go through some sort of, you know, sort of points about these things, about how to, how to write. This is the New Yorker magazine's comment on Time magazine, taking the piss out of Time magazine. It said that Time magazine was always writing these sentences that were, as it puts it, backward ran sentences until real demise. <laughs> now, um, this is what a backward sentence is like. Um, or the top one is, because Labour is a reformist party, it compromises with capitalism. 
Whereas actually the clearer form of writing it, which isn't written backwards, is Labour compromises with capitalism because it's a reformist party. I mean, little grammars I have because I went to a working class school and they never taught me it. But uh, as I understand it, because Labour is a reformist party is the subordinate clause and it comes before the main clause in that, in that first example. Whereas in the second example, it's in its right place. It's the, second, it's the end of the sentence. And I think if you look at that, you, can, you know that one is much more immediately, the second one is much more immediately comprehensible than the first, uh, than the first one. And, um, and <coughs> the New Yorker was saying about Time magazine that it always writes its sentences in this first way. It always runs the backward round sentences until real the mind. That was its point. <laughs> um, this is kind of about the question that you were asking at the back there about, um, about the kind of uh, emotive use of, of, of language. It's from the Economist magazine style guide, and it says, do not be hectoring or arrogant. Those who disagree with you are not necessarily stupid or insane. Nobody needs to be described as silly. Let your analysis prove that he or she is. And I think that's good advice, and it's especially good advice on the left, mm. actually. Um, yeah. Because, um, you know, kind of name calling is part of the territory, but it would be better if there were less of it. And, it will, and it's, it, it's lazy. You know, calling people names is lazy. Um, proving that they're wrong, mistaken, haven't seen the full picture, haven't got the full facts, uh, haven't got the whole context of the analysis, that's harder, but in the end it's always going to be more effective. And the really great news is, if you do four or five paragraphs factually and analytically destroying your opponent's argument, at the end of it, you can call them silly. But if you do it instead of doing it, it really won't work or convince very many uh, very many uh, people. So I think I always think that's good advice. Um, this is also good advice, especially in newspapers. Uh, burying the lead is when the most important part of the story is stuck in some obscure corner, either of the whole article or even of the first sentence. Now, um, I just made this one up, um, obviously. Um, <laughs> on Monday the 30th of January, 2012, singer Kylie Minogue visited the House of Commons. At 1.30pm, she ate lunch in the Commons Tea Room with left-wing MP Jeremy Corbyn. Later in the afternoon, using a Walther PPK, the handgun which, with which Hitler took his life at the end of the Second World War, Miss Minogue assassinated the Prime Minister David Cameron. <laughs> now, that lead is well and truly buried. It is buried a long, long way down. Because obviously, if Miss Minogue had assassinated the Prime Minister, that would be quite an important news story and that would be what your reader would be expecting to read, like right up here. The time she arrived in the House of Commons, <coughs> whether she had me a meal with Jeremy Corbyn, the exact make of the revolver that she, uh, the handgun that she used, um, its uh, heritage as a weapon of assassination, all this is really very, 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 very subordinate to the bit where she assassinates the Prime Minister. So always get the lead right up in the front. And one of the reasons why those tabloid articles are written like they are, with the subsidiary information at the back of the article, is because what they're doing is not burying the lead. All that, if we were writing this as an article, all that other information would be at the back end of the article. So if necessary, you could cut from the bottom of the article and you wouldn't lose the main point of it. If we cut from the bottom of this article, it's dead, just the, well, like the Prime Minister, because the main point has gone there. Um, talk a little bit about subbing copy now, because um, everybody should try to do copy subbing, because it makes you a much, much better writer. If you can cut and reorder other people's work, you begin to get one of the most valuable things, and one of the most difficult things in the world to get, which is to look at your own writing objectively. You know, no, nobody can really do this. You know, they, you know, writing. Uh, well, I don't have children, but people say it's like children, and nobody likes seeing their children cut up. Well, I, as I understand it, not being a parent, but um, uh, and nobody likes seeing their own copy cut um, or reordered or in any way um, suffering from the belief that it wasn't perfect when you finished it. Um, but in fact, everybody is a better writer after they've been copy subbed. Absolutely everybody is improved by copy subbing. This is the second page of um, A People's History of London, which Lindsay German and I 
have just written. Uh, I suppose in fairness I ought to say it's part of the bit that I've written. Um, <laughs> and this is how it came back from the... This is how... It <laughs> <laughs> no, not... <laughs> No, not, and uh, this is how it came back from the copy sub at Verso, the publisher. And as you can see, there's been quite a lot of damage done to it. Um, this entire bit here has been cut out. So is this sentence. So this sentence has been completely rewritten. This has been reordered, and that's been reworded. So the bit that's actually mine left on this page is a minority of it. Um, but that's good. Um, that is what improves you. It'll be mine and Lindsay's name on the cover, and nobody will know who the sub was, and uh, <laughs> it'll read all the better for having gone through this, uh, this process. Paul Foote, who was a friend of mine, who's a, a very, very good tabloid journalist, uh, used to write for the Daily Mirror, um, told me I went with him uh, on many occasions around the old Daily Mirror building uh, when it was down in, uh, in Holborn. And he, he said that on the old Daily Mirror, it won't be the case now with, um, with the uh, online technology, but on the old Daily Mirror, there used to be a subs bench in the mirror, a copy subbing bench, in which there would be 12 copy subs. And the copy that the journalist had written would be given to the sub at the top of the subs bench, and they would cut it, rewrite it, cut it, rewrite it, pass it to the next one, they would cut it, rewrite it, reorder it, and it would go down 12 copy subs. <laughs> and of course, at the end of a bunch of 12 copy subs, there's a barely 50% at best of what the journalist had actually written. But of course, by the end of that process, the copy was tremendously tight, uh, tremendously closely written, uh, exactly what they'd want on the, on the page at the mirror. Now, everybody benefits from uh, being able to do this. As I say, it teaches you, um, if you can copy sub, you're much more likely to be able to write than if you've never been through this, uh, this, uh, this process. Um, so maybe that's where we'll uh, sort of uh, bring, it to a <coughs> bring it to a close. These are uh, copy subbing marks. Um, uh, if you ever work professionally as a journalist, you need to know this, because as that bit of copy that came back from, this is how it will be marked up. This is what the copy sub will do to it, to, to indicate uh, both to you and to the typesetters um, how the text should look on the, look on the, look on the page. So um, we've got, uh, I guess what we'll do now is, uh, this is um, an article which um, it, it's his, uh, his bit of copy, or one page of his bit of copy that came in. Um, it's good for a subbing exercise because uh, the great writer is tremendously knowledgeable. He's half Syrian. He's tremendously knowledgeable about the Middle East. Um, uh, but to be absolutely fair, um, English isn't his first language. So the copy always needs subbing, and that's absolutely uh, fair, fair enough. But it's a brilliant thing to have for an exercise um, for copy subbing. Um, so uh, we're going to have, have a look at this as well. Thanks very much. There's a, there's, another, there's a quote by an, uh, an author called C.J. Cherry. She said, um, it's perfectly okay to write garbage as long as you edit excellently. <laughs> so, uh, um, so that's been, that's been a, uh, an awful lot to take in. So what we'll do now is take um, some questions and uh, comments from people. Um, and then we'll have a go at the, at the subbing exercise. But if people really, you know, we talk about sort of practical issues, if people have got... I and, and more of the, the left is always under more scrutiny than the right is on 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 these issues. I mean, it took it, I mean, it took ages to to, <coughs> to rumble Johan Ari, to, uh, and actually, it happened after he changed his position on the war. I'm not saying it happened because he changed his position on the war, but uh, no doubt he was under greater uh, greater scrutiny. I mean, uh, which of the revisionist historians is it that was uh, Orlando Fijis, isn't it? It mm. was busy. Um, writing up his own reviews and critical notices of other historians under a pseudonym. Now, you know, I mean, this, this, if, you know, if, if somebody on the left had been doing that, they would have been nailed. That would have been the end of their of their career. So we are always under greater scrutiny, and therefore the fact checking is very important. But I would say this about it: you have to go to quite some length. It's not easy, and it and, and it hasn't been made easier in a way by the internet because although there's a lot more information available there's also a lot more disinformation uh, available I mean I was making a documentary on um, on the Vietnam War so I went to check the date um, on the web of the uh, of when the last US troops 
left Vietnam. There were five different dates available and three different dates available on Wikipedia. When, in parentheses, never trust Wikipedia. <laughs> um, you, you, because, because of the way it's compiled, you just can't, I mean, some articles on it are extraordinarily good and as good as anything you'll read anywhere. Mm, some are not. Um, so, you know, the fact checking is, is more difficult than it, than it seems, especially in this age, but, but more important for that, um, uh, for that, for that reason. Uh, I mean, with Facebook or any of these things that are corporate things, all right, we know where they're coming from and why they're doing it, but my position really is that uh, as long as you're not infringing any principles, the more the left can get in and use them for their own purposes, the better. I mean, we find this in Stop the War with the television coverage, and it's often a debate. You know, I get into debates quite a lot of people because people say, "Oh, why are you appearing on press TV? Don't you know it's the, you know, the you know, organ of the I Iranian government? Or why are you on Russia Today? Don't you know it's, you know, Putin's television station?" Yes, you know, of course <laughs> I know that, uh, but I also know there's a reason why the BBC almost never very rarely asks us on to put an anti-war position. I also know why the Iranian station or the Russian station will want to have a spokesperson on who's banging away at the British government. But my view is, if, I mean, the last time I did this, 100,000 people saw the YouTube thing of it. So why wouldn't you do that? It's not that I'm altering anything I'm saying because of it. Um, I'm, so, I'm saying exactly what I would say on whatever channel I appeared on. And if, because of the rivalry between the different nation states and their media apparatuses that gives me an opportunity to make that to a wider audience then 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 take it but uh, so that and that's the view i have to all these facebook and all the and all these things really don't break your principles don't say anything you wouldn't say but if you can get on it and say what you would say anyway why not um on the um uh on the um the the point of view thing you see there is no there, there is no neutral, you know, the, the huge myth is that there is a neutral and objective form of journalism, but there isn't. In the same way that there isn't neutrality on a battlefield. You know, there, there isn't, you know, you're not standing outside. The, 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 the belief that in some way a journalist is standing outside the sort of enormous swirling mass of social conflict and warfare that's going on in society, that isn't true. There is no, there is no kind of, you know, tower from which this field can be observed from a distance and we can describe the events. You're in it. You are in that trench. You are on that field. You are part of it. And every action that you do or don't take <coughs> is an action for or against one other side in this, in this battle. So choose your side. That's the thing. You can either be with the rich and the powerful and the warmongers, or you can be with the people who aren't any of those things in one form or another. And there's a terrific variety of ways in which you can be one or other of these things. But there is no way of avoiding that <coughs> essential, essential choice. And it's my view, actually, that objectivity, telling the truth about the society, um, is rooted in the position you take on that. You know, if you take the position of a tiny, rich, uh, armed minority that's intent on um, maintaining its power, you are unlikely to tell the truth about the way in which the world works. Uh, if you take the position of people who are poor and dispossessed and have nothing to lose by telling the truth about the society, you are more likely to tell the right story. You know, there's a very old adage which says, um, the world always looks different from the cottage than the castle. But the cottage has no interest in lying about the way in which the world works. The castle does have an interest in lying <coughs> about the way in which the world works. So to make a choice in this sense is to make a choice uh, to tell the truth, uh, to be objective, but also to take a side. You know, we're taught that taking sides and telling the truth are uh, opposites. But actually, in this sense, taking a side and telling the truth are the same thing. Thank you, John. Right, I saw some more hands up. Like uh, well, Counterfire is a different thing altogether. Uh, here's an area where we actually do control what the agenda is, and it's a committed agenda. It's committed to trying to unpick the enormous dominance of the right wing in the media and the media uh, and the government and all the rest of its argument in the society. So it's a committed form of, 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 of journalism. But for that reason, and as I said in the last answer, nearer to the truth than the fictitious balance, which isn't a balance. In any case, it's an imbalance. Uh, so, th you know, that's kind of what I think about uh, about that. On the second language thing, 
I don't. I, I mean, if you can do both, that's great, isn't it? I mean, I think people should be encouraged to do to do both. I mean, what m my entirely anecdotal um, kind of experience of this is is that uh, journalists who come from other countries and and they're more familiar with their naturally with their original language tend to get pigeonholed in specialised media's in the you know MA media uh, circles and you know everybody needs to eat you need a job it's like anything else you know journalism at that sense as a as a job is like building Ford cars it doesn't really matter whether you like the Ford car you need the job and you've got to pay the rent so that's where you tend to end up as a political question I think everybody should try to be engaged in the political society where they're living and try to change the society where they're living and the experience of people from other societies enriches that you know deepens that um, strengthens that project and so I would hope that they would be engaged there as well so you know I don't see it as a as a choice other than one that's imposed on you econ economically and to the extent that it is a choice I would choose to be engaged in both in, in both areas if you can um, and you know in, in terms of radical journalism there are plenty of people will, that will will assist you uh, to do that I mean like I was saying about the, the text you've got in front of you uh, it's half Syrian half Swiss his first language certainly isn't English his second language isn't English um, but I mean w we would have been mad because of his experience because of his knowledge of the Arab world you know we couldn't have written it at half the stuff that we've written on the site. We couldn't have produced the book without it. And so is it worth it for us to sub the stuff? Absolutely, of course it's worth it for us to sub the stuff. And that's what how I think it um, should be. Um, on the why write a book? Well, because uh, the book form allows you to carry an argument uh, in depth in a way which, well, Twitter, Twitter. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously doesn't, and and there are dangers of the of the of the, the, the short form is great, but as we know, um, with um, um, Diane Abbott, she got into trouble by not having the room for an adjective. If the adjective had been most or the rich white or whatever, she wouldn't have been in trouble. And there are and, and it simply illustrates the point that um, there are certain arguments which require length documentation, history, theory, and um, when you've done that, it assists people who are using a short form. You know, actually, because we, we'd we already written the London book when the riots took place, so we ripped out a short history of the, of the London riot out of the material for the book and put it on counterfire as whatever it was, 1,500 words, and it got a massive number of hits, mm -hmm. but we couldn't have done the short form Unless we'd already written the written the book, and that I think is an important uh, uh, important um, relationship. Thank you, John. Right. Um, well, we've got the we've got the article uh, that we were going to do some subbing on, but we're kind of running out. If, if there's only one thing that you take out of this, this is the thing to take out of it. You can't be a good writer if you're no writer at all. So you have to just hit the keyboard. The difference actually between people who write and people who don't write is not skill, it's willpower. It's the ability just to sit in front of the screen and get going. And as I say, that's why deadlines, that's why actually being commissioned to write or coming to any publication, but in this case Counterfire, will give you a deadline. And we'll moan at you if you don't hit the deadline. And then after you've given us the copy, we're going to sub the copy. And that's a process which will make you into a, a writer if you're not one if you're not one uh, already and although it looks like a quintessentially individual thing to do writing it's not it's a collective process actually gaining the experience going through the process of writing preparing it for publication is uh, self-evidently from everything we've said today um, I mean writing your diary that's an individual experience but writing for publication is a collective experience and a collective relationship with you, your audience, the other people who are producing <coughs> it, the people who are subbing it, the people who are publishing publishing it. So it should be looked on as a collective political experience, like organising a meeting or a demonstration or anything else. And that's the point that you should enter it into. And the, the, the best thing to do, I guess, when you're writing, is to have an image in your mind of who you're writing for. You know, to, to know why you're writing, who you're, you're writing for. In Michael Foote, um, the... You know, former leader of the Labour Party, who's Paul Foote's um, uncle, um, used to write. I mean, was a very good writer. Actually, he wrote a pamphlet called *The Guilty Men*, which was about the appeasers in uh, in Britain uh, before during the rise of the rise of Hitler. 
um, when it was when it was uh, when it was published, W. H. Smith refused to sell it, and it had to be sold uh, from Barrows in the street, and they sold two hundred thousand copies in about seven in about seven days. So he was a, a considerable writer, and it, but uh, after the war, he had a, a column on the Evening Standard, when the Evening Standard was uh, owned by Lord Beaverbrook, and um, someone asked him. Uh, who who do you imagine? Who do, you know, when you're writing your column, uh, Michael, who do you who do you imagine your audience is? And he said, um, one old man at the top of the building. <laughs> um, now that's that that's what you have to do if you're paid to write as a journalist by the BBC or by anybody else. It's the boss that matters. But when you're writing for us, the audience is somewhere else, and it's the best form of writing because the people who you're writing for are people who are either the victims of the system, or better than that, victims of the system who are trying to change the system, or activists in the movement who are trying to do something about the nature of the system and organise to change it. And you are equipping them with arguments and information and ideas which will assist them in the business of changing the world. And to be honest, if you're not writing for that purpose, why the hell are you writing? Mm -hmm.